go. Yeah. All right. All right. Glory, glory, glory. There we go. There we go. Now we have our official charge, don't we? That's right. All right. Let me just uh, remind you that what we've been sharing in, in this time where we've been basically, uh, basically uh, down from, from our normal church service, uh, I've, been, I've been sharing with you uh, 10 truths about greatness from Israel's greatest king. King David. And uh, we've so far uh, covered about four of them. So when you come back to church next week, um, I'll be, I guess, on about the sixth one because I want to look at, uh, I want to look at uh, the fourth one today. I'll be on the fifth one next week, obviously. I want to look at the fourth one today. We started last week looking at this, but it's just such a, an extensive um, topic in, in the Word. And there's such great uh, truth about this that I believe that we need to hear and experience that I just, uh, you know, we, we, we talked about the beginning last week. And I just want to remind you again, the four great things, the four truths about greatness that we've looked at so far. One is great people become great on the battlefield. So it is the field that God has called you to where you will become great. You don't become great sitting on the couch or, uh, or even um, in a prayer closet somewhere. The battlefield where he's called you to minister, to be, to carry on and carry forward, that's where your greatness will come. The second truth about greatness was everybody makes mistakes. And because everybody makes mistakes, uh, a great person is someone who accepts responsibility for their mistakes and grows from them. The third truth about greatness is that great people must get over the pain of their past in order to reach the destiny that God has called you to. We all have pain. We all have to deal with pain. And, um, and great people are able to deal with this pain and move past this pain and move, move on to be the great person that God has called them. And I'm, just to remind you, when I use the term a great person, I'm not talking in terms of the world, uh, in greatness in the world. Greatness in the world has to do usually with money or power or popularity. And, and, and in order for you to be great, you gotta, be, you gotta have some of that or all of it in this world's term. But to be great in the kingdom of God is to accomplish that which God, which God designs you for. You have a purpose. God created you for a purpose. He's gifted you. He's strengthened you. He's built you with certain abilities and personality traits and all of those kind of things. Well, all of that has a purpose. And if you accomplish that purpose, then you are a great person in the kingdom of God. Now, here's the fourth truth, and this one is where we started last week. And the fourth truth about greatness, David becomes a great example of this fourth truth about greatness as he brings the Ark of the Covenant to the city of Jerusalem so that uh, he can begin a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week praise service around the Ark of the Covenant. And the, and the fourth truth is um, that you are, become a great person. To, when you become a great person, you are a worshiper of God and you must pay the price to be so. You're going to have to pay a price to be a worshiper of the Lord. And I know that many of us, we come into church services and we're encouraged by our praise teams, our worship teams. They play and they sing and they encourage us uh, to uh, follow them and to sing and to exalt the Lord and to worship the Lord and, 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 and to give him the praise that he deserves. Well, great people are worshipers of the Lord and not only worshipers at church, but worshipers in their life. And it, all, and it always costs something to be a worshiper of the Lord. I called you last week to a scripture in Acts chapter 15 that happened at the council in Jerusalem when the disciples or the apostles and the other leaders of the church, uh, Peter and James were two that spoke and, and Barnabas and Silas were also there. 
But, all, but, but as many of the other po apostles that could be there were there and the leaders of the church. And the, and the decision was about whether they, were going, whether they were going to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And of course, the answer, obviously, thank the Lord, was yes, because if it was no, then none of us would have the gospel because we're all, we're all Gentiles. But uh, the answer was yes, we're going to take, them to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Well, James, who was the moderator of the meeting, uh, spoke at the meeting a passage of Scripture that is recorded in Acts chapter 15. And it's, it's, a, it's a quote from an Old Testament prophet, and I'll talk to you about that toward the end, but, but it, it, it sums up what, what the thought of the, of the council was about taking the gospel out in the streets to people who are non-Jews and, and, and anybody that needs the Lord. And, and here's what James said. It, it's Acts chapter 15, uh, verse 15 and following. And with the words of the prophets, and with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as, as it is written, after this I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. So the Lord himself is speaking this to the prophet, prophet Amos, and, and he's talking about a time when, when the Spirit of God is going to be poured out on this earth, and God says, and, and I myself am going to personally rebuild the tabernacle of David. Now, I know for many people, you've never even heard of the tabernacle of David. You've heard of the tabernacle in the wilderness, Moses' tabernacle. It went with the children of Israel across the desert and so forth. And when they came into the promised land, it basically sat at Shiloh for a little while, and then it went to Abinadab's house for 20 years. And that's where it is now, uh, where before David uh, goes to get it and bring it to Jerusalem. It's been sitting for 20 years at Abinadab's house, house on a hill, it's said. And um, Saul has never sought to bring it back. Saul's been the, Saul was the king of Israel for 40 years. And Saul never sought to bring the ark to, to the city of Jerusalem or any other city, as a matter of fact. Uh, there's a verse, and I was uh, talking with Pastor Tanya uh, this morning or last night about it. I said, you know, there's a verse in the, that I read. I can't remember exactly where it is, but it, it was about the fact that Saul didn't seek the ark's counsel very often. In other words, when he went into battle and he, and he, and he had questions to ask, he, he, he didn't go before the ark of the covenant and, and inquire about anything, which was uh, what had been done and what was done. And Anyway, the point being that Saul just didn't have any respect for God at all. He just was very um, half-hearted, uh, casual about things that had to do with God, and, 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 and he didn't have a heart. And, and that was really what took the kingdom away from him. And the fact that David loved God, worshiped God, believed in God, wanted to get the ark to the city and all of those things just proved that the truth of, of the passage that says that David was a man after God's own heart. David was sincere about God. David loved God and he, and he pursued God and he was unashamed to, to worship God. And so this made David a man after God's own heart. So uh, we're gonna, I wanna go now just to the passage. This is in 2 Samuel chapter 6, and it's the whole chapter, and I'm just going to scan through this with you because I, I believe it'll speak to you about worship in your own life and about what, uh, what we must do to be a worshiper of the Lord and, um, and what David had to pay the price of when he decided that he was going to be a worshiper of the Lord because you'll remember that back in the days of the kings, you didn't have open worship and celebration like we have now. I mean, it was, the law was the law, and you had a lot of pomp and circumstance, and you had a lot of ceremony, and you had, a, you had to obey the law. It, religion was full-blown in those days. And David is the only worshiping king that Israel ever had. And he was the only worshiper. He, he ushered in worship to the Lord while he was the king, and Israel prospered under that king whose heart was after God's own heart, and he was, he's still considered after almost 3,000 years to be the greatest king that Israel ever had. But he had to pay a price to be a worshiper, and what price did he pay? Let's look, beginning at verse 1, 2 Samuel 6, 
Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring forth, to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherub. So they set the ark of God on a new cart. Let me, let me just stop there for one second. The, uh, the ark of God was not to be carried on a new cart. As a matter of fact, the only people that ever carried the ark of God on a cart were the Philistines. And the Philistines had stolen the ark, and that's a big story, and I shared some of it last week. It's amazing what happened. And, and the ark just um, scared them to death and, and did some things while they had it in their presence that were just overwhelming to them. And they decided, we need to get the ark back to Israel. And so they hooked it to some milk cows, built a new cart, hooked it to some milk cows, sent them down the road toward Israel. And when the, and when the cart passed the, the, the county line, so to speak, Israel, some guys from Israel got it, uh, chopped the cart up, uh, made a fire, and sacrificed the cows pulling it as a, as a burnt offering. They took the ark up to Abinadab's house because Abinadab's son, uh, Eliezer, had, was a Levite, and he, he had authority to handle the ark. So they took it up there, and they set it right there, uh, and, and, and that's where it's been. Now, uh, According to the Word of God in the, book of, in the book of Exodus, when Moses was given descriptions about the ark and how to build the ark, he was given every detail, and he was also given then the exact way that the ark of the covenant was supposed to be carried. The ark of the covenant was supposed to be carried with poles on each side. It had a, four, four rings, one on each corner. Poles slid through there. And that, and that Levites, which were sanctified priests, were, were, were on each end of the pole, and they would squat down, put the show, pole on their shoulder, and lift the ark, and all four corners and all four would carry the ark of the, of the Lord across the desert or wherever they went. They also covered it with a, blue, with a blue veil and badger skin so that the Levites carrying the ark couldn't even look at the ark themselves. This ark represented God. Back when Moses met with God on Mount Sinai, you remember what Moses said? Moses said, who are you, Lord? Let me see you. And God said, I can't let you see my face and live. And he said, get over there in the rock. And he hit him behind the rock. And he said, I'm gonna put my hand over you. And I'm gonna pass before you. And when I pass, I'm gonna move my hand and you can see my back, so to speak. Well, Moses wanted to see God, and, and, and so God allowed him that back part of you, but, but he wouldn't let the people see God. And so God said, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to, let you, I'm going to give you a piece of furniture that represents me. And this piece of furniture, when the people say, we want to see God, this piece of furniture is going to be, is going to represent me. I'm going to inhabit it. I'm going to fill it. It's going to represent me. It's going to be powerful and mighty, and you carry it before the people. And that piece of furniture was called the Ark of the Covenant. And it actually was two pieces of furniture. It was a box, a wooden box that was covered with gold. It was about 48 by 40 or so by 36 wide. It was about you know, like a big cedar chest almost. And inside it, they put the, the covenants, that the, the commandments of God that were broken. They put a pot of manna, golden pot of manna, and they put Aaron's rod that budded. And on top of it, they put a solid gold sheet that covered it like a top, a lid, with, with cherubim, that were, were beaten, which they were, that means that they just, it, it was all one single piece. They, the, they took craftsmen and they, and, they, and they beat out an image of a, of a cherubim angel with its wings stretched toward the middle on each end. And those wings almost met right in the middle. And right in the middle, you know, I remember out of the first verse we read tonight, God said, I, I, I'm, uh, this is called uh, the, the, the meeting of God, and I'm going to meet you at the wings of the cherubim. And so God, God spoke to the children of Israel as the glory of God hovered above that point where the wings of the cherubim came together. So this piece of furniture represented God. This was God that they were after. And so David goes out with all of these men, and he's going to bring this ark back. And the first thing they do is put this ark on a, a, on a cart. And, and that's not the way you carry God. Uh, you can't be lazy and, and be a worshiper of God. Evidently, David was not prepared 
uh, for this. David did not study for this. David assumed some things. Evidently, the Philistines carried it on a cart, so we can carry it on a cart. And uh, that's going to be trouble. That's going to be a no-no for God. All right. Put it on a cart, and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, which, by the way, they were also Levites. And the Levites were the, the, the priestly tribe. They were the ones that could handle the ark. So Uzzah's one of them. And, and, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart, and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments, of fir wood, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on sistrums and on cymbals. This was the first time that music has ever been associated with the ark. The ark set in the tabernacle of Moses. There was no music played in the tabernacle of Moses. The tabernacle of Moses was about law and performance and sacrifice. It was about the rules. It was about, uh, about putting off the judgment of sin. It was animal sacrifices. It, it had nothing to do with music and worship and joy and spontaneity or any of that. The ark had never had music played around it. Later on, it'll be placed in Solomon's temple, and they don't play music in Solomon's temple either. So David, for the first time now, uh, sets a new precedence, and he's playing all of this music, and the people are playing, and they're, they're beginning to carry this ark now from Abinadab's house toward the city of Jerusalem, which, by the way, is about nine miles. So they're moving out, and they're going, and they got to go nine miles with this thing. And when they came to Nashon's threshing floor... The threshing floor was where they threshed the wheat, and it was a you know, big area where everybody brought their wheat to be threshed and to be uh, bagged and carried and so forth. And, and everybody knew it. It was, it was basically a mile or so down the road from Abinadab's house. So they made it about a mile down the road, and, and they came to the floor, Neshon's threshing floor, and when they did, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark. Well, because David wasn't prepared, now we have uh, someone that's died. And, and it's Uzzah. Uzzah's a Levite, by the way. And you say, what difference does that make? Well, Uzzah knows better than to touch the ark. Uzzah's, Uzzah has been instructed. He's from the tribe that carries the ark. He knows the ark is not to be carried on a cart, and he knows that he's not to touch the ark. Now, uh, uh, the, only, uh, the only conclusion I can come to about this drastic measure by God of killing somebody who just reaches up to touch, you know, it's almost like, why would God, why would God do that? Because uh, Uzzah was just trying to keep the ark from maybe tipping off of the cart. Uh, he was trying to do something nice for God, so to speak. I got to keep, protect God from falling. Well, yeah, exactly. Um, the only conclusion I can come to is that because David was not prepared, David didn't handle God in the right way. In other words, David handled God in a disrespectful way. God says, you're not going to handle me like the Philistines handle me. I allowed the Philistines to handle me that way because they don't know any better. You know, in, in the book of Acts, there's a passage that says that in former days, uh, I always remember it saying God winks at sin, but it doesn't use the word wink, but it, it really means that. It's like, it's like uh, in, in times past, God has uh, allowed us to, to sin without destroying us because we didn't know any better. We were ignorant. Well, here in moving this ark, uh, we, we have some people that know better than this. David, David uh, got lazy and, and, got, and, and, and just took God for granted and disrespected God in every way and assumed some things that God was going to let them carry the ark the same way the Philistines did. So God says, no, you're not going to carry me like the world carries me. 
And, and, and as the ark left Abinadab's house, I, I, I think the, the Lord was angered with this. I think that, that, it, that it was a, a disrespect to him. And so he, uh, he, he was angry about the way he was being handled. And, uh, and as they went down the road and they came to Nashon's, Nashon's threshing floor and the oxen stumbled and, and, the, and Uzzle reached up, uh, it was almost more than God could stand. It was almost like, man, I, I don't need you to prop me up. And because God was seeing here, I think, a trend of disrespect toward him and, and, and his nature, that he said, I got to stop this immediately. And of course, the immediate uh, call was, there goes Uzzah, and uh, <laughs> poor Uzzah, he's, he's gone now because God wants to make a point um, about his presence and about taking him seriously. And, and he did, and, it, and he scared the people. And he scared David. The next verse says, and David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah, which means fried Uzzah to this day. No, no it doesn't really mean fried. It doesn't really mean fried Uzzah. I was just joshing. It means outbreak against Uzzah. In other words, David said, I'm going to call this place Perez Uzzah because God just uh, went off on Uzzah. And, uh, and it's known that actually to this day, the Bible says. But, but the point here is that when David struck Uzzah, uh, when God struck Uzzah, David got mad about it. It made, da it made David angry. And of course, when David became angry, the first, what he began to do immediately was to stop worshiping God. I mean, he, he halted the whole thing right there. His worship, they, they, they didn't continue to play the music. They weren't still going toward Jerusalem. Uh, everything stopped when David got angry. Now, the second thing, and I'm, I'm, I got a point about this I want to tell you, but I want to read this next line. Verse nine, uh, David was afraid of the Lord that day. So David is not only angry at God, now he's afraid of the Lord that day, and he says, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. So here is David, and I, I want you to, I want you to, to know this about, about worship. We worship, one, one, of the, one of the things that allow us to worship and cause us to worship is our concept of God. Uh, you will not worship God in a stronger way than your concept of God will allow you to worship. And by your concept of God, I mean, what do you think about God? Is God good? Uh, Pastor Tanya mentioned it up here, or mentioned it in, in the music that you saw today, that God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Well, if you believe that, if that's your concept of God, then you're gonna worship God because God's good. And he's good all the time. And he's loving and he's gracious and he's wonderful and he's passionate and, he, and you can count on God. But if God does something that is contrary to your concept of his nature, then all of a sudden it's gonna rattle you in your worship. And so here is David. Now get, keep in mind, David is doing something he shouldn't be doing. David has a good heart. He wants to bring the worship and the ark back to the city of Jerusalem so all of the nation of Israel can be blessed. That's his motive. His motive is he wants everybody to be blessed. So he's doing a good thing. He's wanting a good thing. The only problem is he's doing it in the wrong way. And, and he's doing it in the way the world would go about doing it because he's too lazy to study or he doesn't think he has to study or he doesn't think it matters how you handle God. Maybe he heard the Philistines brought it on a new card and he just said, well, that sounds like a good idea to me because if, if you don't have to get the priests and you don't have to get them cleansed and you don't have to get them sanctified and you don't have to do any burnt offerings and you don't have to do anything special, you just take this ark and put it on the cart, man, that's going to save us a lot of time and trouble and boy, that's a good idea. And I don't know why we hadn't thought about that. So, so David, David has caused all of this. He's the king. 
He has advisors. He has Nathan the prophet. He has Zadok the priest. I mean, he has all kinds of, of people that can be consulted about the books of Moses and what the books of Moses say about how to carry this ark. But he just grabs 30,000 men of Israel, goes out there and says, all right, boys, let's get the ark back home. And because he did, now God has responded negatively to all of his uh, delusion here. And when God responds negatively and says, you're not going to handle me like that. You're not going to treat me the way the world treats me. David now gets angry about that. And he gets afraid. He gets fearful. And, and I'm sure that as David became angry, the hurt whisperer began to whisper into his ear. You know the hurt whisperer, right? <laughs> One of the Greek words for him is satanus. I know it may sound like a Spanish word more than a Greek word, but it is a Greek word, satanus, which we get our English word Satan, which means to oppose. When the word Satan is used, it means you're being opposed. He is opposing you. The other word that's used for the hurt whisper is diablos. Diablos is where we get the word devil. And when that word diablos is used, it means the accuser or the slanderer. So when Diablos is talking to you, you know what he's doing? He's slandering you. He's accusing God. He's accusing anybody that you're angry at. He's going to accuse them. You know, the Bible says that we're, not to go to, that we're not to go to sleep at night with anger on our heart. You know, don't let the sun go down on your wrath is what it said. Because if you do, you give the devil a mighty foothold. You know what that means? It means that if you go to bed at night and you're laying there in bed and you're angry at your, at, at your wife or your husband and you got your back turned to them and you're not even breathing because you don't want to give them the pleasure of even knowing that you're alive and you're as angry as you can possibly be at them and you don't want to talk to them, guess who's going to start whispering in your ear? The slanderer, the accuser. And what's going to happen all night long is they're going to, you're going to be counseled by the devil all night long, accusing bringing up every negative thing that he can think about, bringing out every negative trait, misinterpreting things that were said, bringing up things that didn't even happen and convincing you that it happened. Yeah. And you'll wake up madder in the morning than you went to bed at night. Why? Because you've been counseled by the slanderer all night. And that's the mode of operation of the devil. He's the hurt whisperer. He's at every funeral, every hospital room, every tragedy, every hardship, every hurt that is in your life. And he's on your shoulder whispering why you ought to be offended by this. Because he knows if he can offend you about God, that you'll stop worshiping God. And so here's David. And the hurt whispers whispering, God doesn't love you. He let those Philistines move this thing and he didn't do anything to them, but you did it and he just killed somebody. And that's cause God, you can't trust God. He'll do it every time. You can't love God. He doesn't love you. He's, look, you were trying to do the right thing and look what he did to you. I mean, all kinds of accusations and slanders and David quits worshiping the Lord, gets angry about it and says, I'm not even bringing this thing back, man. I can't bring this thing back. What, this thing's deadly. I can't, I, I can't. And he gets all uh, 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 cluttered about this thing. And he said, anybody want, anybody want, we, gotta, we can't leave it in the middle of the road. Anybody want this thing? And evidently, Obed-Edom, a Gittite. Now, a Gittite is someone from Gath, from the city of Gath. You know who else is from Gath, right? Goliath. <laughs> he was Goliath from Gath. He's a Philistine. Obed-Edom's a Philistine. And little Obi stand out beside the road and said, I'll take it. And David takes that ark and puts it down there in Obed-Edom's living room in his house. And uh, that ark stays there for three months in Obed-Edom's house. Because David doesn't want to have anything to do with the ark anymore. And David said, I'm offended and I'm, going, I'm, I'm, taking, I'm getting up and I'm getting out of here and I'm going home. And he goes back to Jerusalem. Because the devil has convinced David that God is angry, God is violent, God is hateful, God is vengeful, God is childish, he's, he's an absentee landlord, he can't be trusted, he's fickled, you can't depend on him. 
He's not worthy of worship. And David believes it. And so David hurries back to Jerusalem. Verse 11, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. Why didn't God kill him? He's a Philistine. I mean, my goodness, he's not even an Israelite. And he not only didn't kill him, it says, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. That ark's sitting in the middle of Obed-Edom's living room. I would imagine that things changed around Obi's house. There probably wasn't any cussing in the house. They probably went outside to smoke and, and drink and whatever else they were going to do. And I mean, you can bet that it kind of sanctified the place up a little bit, I would imagine, because Obed saw what it did to us. You know, I mean, he knew about the ark and the danger of the ark and so forth, and it sat right there in his house. And it not only did not it not destroy the little Philistine, it blessed everybody in his household. Obi's wife got more attractive. Obi's crops got more plush. When everybody else's crops were drying up because there wasn't any rain, Obi got all the rain he needed. And then when it was time to harvest, the rain stopped and the fields dried out and Obi got to harvest his crop. His kids made A's at school. I mean, everything, his dog had big bone to play with. I mean, everything in Obi's house got blessed because of the ark of God. Now, I wonder what David thought was going to happen when he brought that ark down to Obi's house. I wonder what he thought was going to happen. Because David knew what that ark could do. David knew how many people that ark had killed. David knew the danger of, of, of handling that ark lightly. I just submit to you that he probably did he obviously didn't care what it did. Because he was now by, by now, so he's angry and he's upset and, and he doesn't care about anybody but himself. And I'm sure that that now David's back at the palace and the hurt whispers back there with him now, and he gets the word, you know what? Ever since you put that ark out at Obi's house, you know what's happened out at Obi's house? He's been blessed, man. Obi won the lottery, hallelujah. You know? And I'm sure that just kind of pierced David's heart. It was almost, and the devil said, yeah, see there, God hates you and he loves him because he kills somebody when you were around the ark and he blesses him when he's around the ark and he wins the lottery and everything's great for him. Trying to, trying to hinder what David was doing with the ark and hinder his worship. And so David now Went, went and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. Evidently, it didn't take long once David heard that the ark had blessed Obi's house for him to say, uh, I made a mistake. Let me, let me, let me study up on this. He, he, he probably even talked to Nathan, the prophet, who was his pastor, and said, what does the book of Moses say we should do about bringing this ark? And then he said, well, here it is. And he read it and it said, you stick the poles and you get the sanctified priest and you get them down and they're ready and they're prepared and they've been washed and they've been cleansed and the sacrifices have been made. I mean, a lot of work. Yeah, it takes a lot of trouble. It takes a lot of work to praise the Lord. Yeah, you don't just stagger in to praise. And, they, and, they, and, 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 and so they, David takes them and they pick up the ark like they were supposed to and they began to walk with the ark, and verse 18 says, and so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. This time, David said, we're doing it right. Yeah. And it only took them six steps, <laughs> six steps to realize that God was going to allow this to happen, that this was the way to do it, and that God was not gonna kill anybody. And so when they got the six steps, they put the ark down and they said, we need to make a sacrifice before the ark. And they sacrificed the fatted lambs and the bullock. And then they picked the, picked the ark back up and, 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 they, and they carried the ark on down the road toward the city of Jerusalem on the shoulders of sanctified priests. Priests who had been prepared. Now, I don't have time to really preach a whole message on these next couple of passages, but I just want to say to you that you are a sanctified priest. I know that we don't use that word a lot because it seems to be an old word and it just doesn't carry the weight, but God has, God has saved our soul and cleansed our life 
And now we, because we're believers in Christ, are not only priests, we're sanctified priests, we're holy priests, and we're not only a priest, we're also a king, just like Jesus. Yeah, in 1 Peter, and I'm just gonna re zoom past these, but I just wanna say it to you. In 2 Peter 2, verse five, you also, this is what Peter says about you, you also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse nine, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's a great passage, isn't it? And in Revelation five, it says, and, and he has made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. And so God says, you know, it's a priest, it's a sanctified priest that carries the ark. And it just so happens that's good news for us because we're sanctified priests. God's prepared us. God saved our soul, washed us clean by the blood of the lamb, and he's made us a priest before God. A priest just means someone who comes before God. And that just means I don't have to have anybody go to God for me. I go to God for myself. I don't, need, I don't need a pastor, I don't need a pope, I don't need a pappy, I don't need anybody to go and talk to God for me. I go to talk to God myself. I am a priest before God and I represent myself. And so, so anyway, David got the priest and they, they're, they're carrying the ark toward the city now. In verse 14, then David danced before the Lord with all his might and David was wearing a linen ephod. Um, worship requires emotional energy. I mean, here's David dancing with all his might before the Lord. Um, physical dance, emotional energy, relational energy. Um, what, we, what we have a tendency to want God to do in the area of worship is we just want God to overwhelm us. It's almost like, um, have you been, ever been in a service where people were really, truly, um, uh, demonstrably worshiping the Lord? I mean, you, you, you've seen it. They've been dancing or they've been waving a flag or whatever it might be. And, and when you look at them, they just look like, boy, they are in such, um, such ec ecstasy before God in this worship experience that they're experiencing. And you're standing there and you're probably holding on to the back of the pew or the seat or whatever before you because you're a little bit, of, a little bit scared about this. And, and, uh, and, and you're thinking about, boy, I wish I could worship like that. I wish I could sense like that. I wish I could. And, and you see them in great joy, great enthusiasm, it, God's blessing, and it's just a, a wonderful experience. And the reason they're having that is because they're expending the en energy to have it. What we want is God to overwhelm us so we don't have to put any energy forward to have those same wonderful experiences with God. And I'm just saying you that that doesn't happen. I'm saying that unless you build the, uh, unless you build the atmosphere and the throne in your own life that God can come in and be God in, you'll never experience that worship like that. So here is David. David is the king of Israel. He takes off his kingly garments and he puts on an ephod, which is the garment of a, of, a, of a high priest, a praise leader. And he's dancing out before this ark, and he's going down the road, and this thing's going to go about, well, about eight more miles down the road. And David is just whirling and dancing before the Lord, and the music is playing all around the ark. And, and, and so verse 15, so David... And all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. So this giant caravan of David, and I don't know how many people he has with him, but you know, the first time he went out there, he took 30,000 of his best men. Well, let's say this time he only takes half that many. That's 15,000 men are with him. Or even half that, 7,500 men are with him. But it's a big crew is what I'm trying to say to you. David's not by himself with these Levites alone carrying this ark down the road. There are people that are playing instruments. There are, there's, it's like a giant parade that's coming down the road. Well, the people in the city of Jerusalem where the, where the, where the palace is, where David lives, David's told him that they're gonna bring the Ark of the Covenant back to the city. And the people are all excited about this. And the people are just buzzing and they're excited and, they're, and, they're, and they climb up on the wall of the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is called the city that is set on a hill. And it has seven gates around the city. And the seven gates are closed 
in order to keep enemies out, and then they will be opened in order to let friends come in. And so the gates of the city remain closed so that no enemy might come in. They have to be opened when a friend would come. And the people are on the walls, hanging off the walls, hanging over the walls, looking down, chattering, great excitement, great anticipation about the ark of the Lord. David's bringing the ark of the Lord. And they're all out and they're watching. And then way in a distance, you can, you can, you can barely hear the noise of, of, of a... Of a of a team approaching. Uh, you can hear a little bit of it because music is being played and people are shouting and David is dancing and, 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 and it's a commotion coming down the road. And then as that commotion comes closer, the, the people are looking up that northern road that, that goes to, to Nashon's threshing floor and, 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 and as just a moment, they begin to see that noise and they see, that, see it become closer. And as it rounds maybe a little, a little slight bend in the road, they can see the first... Uh, the, they can see David out front dancing and whirring before God. They can see uh, the musicians out playing and, 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 and others dancing and they're bringing the ark and they see the processional and it's bringing and then it goes down into the valley just before it comes up into the city and when it goes down into the valley, now it's close enough for the people of the city to begin hearing what the, what the parade is singing as they bring the Ark of the Covenant back into the city of Jerusalem. And what they're singing as they come up that hill toward the gates of Jerusalem, they're singing Psalm 24. Psalm 24 is a song that David wrote about the king and his kingdom. And as they approach the city, the, David and his company began to sing out, Lift up your heads, O you hills, and be lifted up, you everlasting gates, and the king of glory shall come in. And the people on the wall yell back, Who is this king of glory? And then the company from the valley yells, The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And then, the, and then the, the parade yells out again as if to ask the same question to the, uh, them again. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Yes, lift them up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. And the people say on the gate says, Who is the king of glory? And the crowd yells back, The Lord strong and mighty in battle. He is the king of glory. And the parade, the gates swing open and the parade enters the city of Jerusalem. And David takes the ark right into the center of town and he takes it and he sets it inside a tabernacle that he has built in the city for the ark to sit under. It's called the Tabernacle of David. The Tabernacle of David is not like the Tabernacle of Moses and it's not like Solomon's Simple. It is a simple little one-room structure with four tent posts with flaps on the side of the tent thrown up so that no matter where you look at the ark, you can see the ark in the middle of that tabernacle. The tab the, now the ark of the covenant is not hidden behind a holy of holies. It's not hidden behind a veil as thick as a, horse, uh, as a man's hand. The Holy of Holies is exposed right out there. God is exposed so that all the people can see him. Anytime they want to see God, they can walk out onto the street and at any angle they can watch, they can look and see God in the middle of David's tabernacle for themselves. Not one single Israelite that walked across the desert with Moses ever saw the Ark of the Covenant. Their eyes never laid on God. No one that ever went in Solomon's temple ever saw the Ark of the Covenant. They never saw God. The only person that ever saw the ark was the high priest of the nation and that was only once a year when he was allowed to go in on the day of atonement and make sacrifices for the people. And yet here David has brought the ark out and set it in the middle of the town in a little one room flaps up tent so that anybody can see God who wants to see God. And this is why God said it won't be the tabernacle of, day, of Moses I rebuild in that day. 
And it won't be the temple of Solomon that I rebuild in that day. It's going to be the tabernacle of Moses that I build in that day. God said, I will do it myself. Tabernacle of David that I will build in that day. And God said, and I will do it. I, the one who am speaking to you, myself, I will do it. And I'm going to do it so that the Gentiles can even be saved. And anyone that looks can be saved. And David brings it and sets it in. He makes a sacrifice. I won't read the rest of the scripture. I'll just tell you real quick. He makes a sacrifice to it. But when they set it in there, they do a, they do a, a blood sacrifice, which is the only time in David's tabernacle, is the, do they ever do a blood sacrifice? Every other sacrifice they make from this time forward will be a sacrifice of praise and worship. And he gives the people a loaf of bread, uh, a piece of, of cooked meat, and uh, a, ra- a cake of raisins. And he sends them home to enjoy a feast. All the people of the city sends them home to have a feast with their family. And David leaves there. And David goes to his home in order to tell his wife about the great thing that has happened and that God is in the city of Jerusalem. And as he approaches his house, you know, you know David married Saul's, uh, Saul's daughter, right? Michael, Saul's daughter. Well, you know, Saul was an arrogant, half-hearted man who, who didn't seek the heart of God. That's why God removed him and put in a man that was after his own heart. Saul wasn't after God's heart. Well, Saul's daughter is watching David, her husband, through the window, and she says, when he comes in, she says, uh, I saw you, I, I saw you. I, I was looking out the window when you were coming into the city. Now, my question would be, well, why weren't you down there waiting on the ark? Well, we know why she wasn't, because she didn't, she was half-hearted, arrogant, just like her dad. And she said, I was watching out the window, and you brought it in, and I could see you dancing. You looked like, a, you looked like the city fool down there dancing like that. David looked at her and said, well, you think that was bad. He said, I wasn't really ready this time. He said, next time I'm going to be ready and I'm going to be way more undignified than this. And besides this, the reason that I did that is because I have a heart for God. Unlike your arrogant, half-hearted, lip service only, and I'm I'm putting in a few words there, (laughs) father... Who, this is why God took the kingdom away from you and your father and gave it to me because I'm not afraid to worship God. And the Bible says, and Michael was barren. She had no children until the day she died. Uh, the, ark, the, 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 the ark of the covenant and the tabernacle of David. The Ark of the Covenant stayed in the tabernacle of David and David stationed the Levites around it for tw- 24 hours a day, seven days a week. David often came to the Ark of the Covenant and prayed and asked for God's direction as he led the city. The city of Jerusalem was, was blessed and David's life was blessed because of his ability and his love for God to bring the Ark in. Look, it costs something to worship the Lord. It costs time, it costs energy, it costs preparation, it may even cost, cost the, the loss of, pe- of some people in your life that don't understand why you would worship and praise the Lord. You might have to get over some fear. It might take a, a certain amount of integrity. I mean, it costs to, to praise the Lord. And not only to be a praiser when you walk into a church service, but to be a praiser on your own. To praise the Lord in those times in your life to, to take time to, to exalt him and to man. You know, I know, look, anybody can praise the Lord when everything's going fine. Yeah. When, the, when the kids are behaving, which is probably seldom, but it does happen. When, when everybody's happy, the job's good, life's good, the money's good, everything's good. It's easy to praise the Lord. But what about those times where it doesn't look like the blessings of God are there? Well, that's when it takes extra effort to praise the Lord. And if you're going to be a great person, if you're going to be a person that accomplishes the greatness that God has created you for, you're going to have to be a person who praises him no matter what. 
in every situation. And it's going to cost you something, but great people pay the price to be worshipers of the Lord. Oh, by the way, the tabernacle of David, the tabernacle of David was spoken of by Amos the prophet in Amos chapter 9. You can read it. In Amos chapter 9 are also the famous verses that said that the plowman was going to overtake the reaper and that the sower of seeds was going to overtake the wine press and that the mountains would melt with the fervent heat of God. It was in that same passage. And what that's talking about is the same thing Jesus was talking about in John chapter 4 when Jesus said, don't say there are yet four months to harvest. Lift up your eyes and look to the fields, for they are white with harvest. And what's that all about? It's all about a time where God promises that his Holy Spirit is going to be loosed on this earth and that, and that men and women and boys and girls will be coming to him in such numbers and in such great population that, the sea, there, that there won't be any distinction between the seasons. In other words, there won't be a time to sow seed, a time for the crop to grow, and a time to harvest the crop. The crop is going to be growing and being harvested so fast that the plowman will be in the field the same time the reapers are in the field because everything's going so fast that they'll just interact with each other because God's Spirit will be so loosed on this earth at that time that people will be coming to him and the kingdom of God will be growing and expanding in just tremendous numbers. And of course, you know what he's talking about. He's talking about the period of grace, that period that we're in. You know what the tabernacle of David is? You're the tabernacle of David. God built you. Yes, he did. God took you. God saved you. God built you. He's the only one who did it. He put inside you his Holy Spirit you are empowered by his spirits and his giftings and you are sent out in the world as a portable tent, so to speak, for the tabernacle of God who lives on the inside of you. God doesn't want to be hidden from this world. God doesn't want to be in some back room somewhere where nobody can see him. God wants to be right out there where everyone could see him. What does Corinthians say about us in 1 Corinthians 6? That we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And God says, you take that spirit and you go out and you let the world see because when the world sees me, even the Gentiles will come to me. Even, even this world, this earth would come to me. And so we've been called to go and take the world. We are the tabernacle of David and it cost us something to praise. All right, let, let's, let's bow.